Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode where I'm going to be interviewing Thomas J. Ord on open theism and uh, some of the contents of his book, God Can't, as well, which I've read in preparation for this. Um, and so you, I, I suppose you describe yourself as a philosopher and theologian, and you're teaching at North, uh, North Wind Theological Seminary, is that right? Still, that's right, I don't... North Wind. That's, yep, uh, I've only been there a year. I've taught in various uh, educational institutions for the last 20 years or so. And do you want to, I suppose, at the start of this, to for people who aren't familiar with you or your work, if you paint a bit of a picture of your background, so what your um, relationship to Christianity is, how you ended up um, basically teaching this stuff full time from, you know, wh wherever it was that you started, was it an interest in philosophy? Have you always been a Christian? Were you raised that way? Um, yeah, did I'd you like convert that. into it for some reasons? Yeah. You. Yeah. I, uh, my parents were Christians. So we attended church a lot. I like to say I gave my life to Jesus many times as a young person. Uh, by the time I was in high school and college, so uh, I guess I shouldn't use those terms here, <laughs> uh, ages 15 to about 22, I was a really avid evangelist. I was one of these annoying people who would talk to you on airplanes or at the bar or at the beach about Jesus. And um, then at the end of my college career, I took a course in philosophy of religion. And for the first time, I read the sophisticated writings of atheists, agnostics, people from other religious traditions. And um, they were pretty smart. <laughs> and I took their ideas seriously. And I came to the place where I didn't think I had good grounds anymore to believe there was a God. In fact, I remember coming to pick up my fiance, who's now my wife, her getting in the car and me saying to her, I just can't believe in God anymore. Right. And for me, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like the church hurt me or I was trying to be a rebel, you know. It was For me, it was intellectual reasons. Um, right. The, the reasons I had for thinking there was a God just didn't make sense. But I kept at the intellectual quest and eventually came to the place where I thought it was more plausible than not that there is a God. I'm not certain. I wasn't certain then. I'm not certain now. But I think there's good arguments. There's good evidence. There's religious experiences that suggest to me that there's a God. And really, at least at the beginning, there were two big things that kind of brought me back. One, I had this search for ultimate meaning, and I couldn't think that there was something like ultimate meaning if there wasn't a ground for meaning that most people call God. And the second one is I had these deep intuitions that I ought to be a loving person and that other people ought to be loving, that in some sense, love is the answer. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't account for it fully through evolutionary biology, environmental pressures, upbringing, et cetera. And I thought, it, you know, maybe there's something like a being people call God who's loving, who is the source of these intuitions I have. And um, that was, you know, for quite a while, my theology was really thin. <laughs> I believe right. there was a loving God. I thought Jesus is pretty cool. And that was about it. <laughs> right. um, but over time, I've developed uh, other insights and ideas. And I suspect we're going to talk about those today. So if we if we begin to paint the picture of what open theism is, um, and I guess I I want to say in, t in terms of where I'm coming from and my understanding before beginning to read your book, I suppose, in, in philosophy of religion, people talk about kind of models of God uh, and there's like a, a, a God of classical theism is going to have certain attributes. Um, maybe people might... Uh, one thing that's a little bit edgy, so to speak, that people might go down the route of is something called like apophatic theology, where it's like, oh, we can't talk about this God in a certain way. Or um, some people go down a route of like process theology or something like that. But I think to to most Christians, that, or at least most Christians who I know, they want to say, well, God has these omni attributes. You know, there's nothing that there's nothing God can't do. God can do anything. God is all loving. God is all good, all powerful, all knowing. Um, whereas I suppose your view thinks about those things and it, it doesn't just it, it doesn't just go oh i'll just grab all those because it kind of sounds right as something at, at the start <laughs> what what is open theism to to begin yeah. with yeah 
Well, um, before I answer that, let me just mention, I love the way you set that up with certain models of God. I wrote a book uh, in 2015 called The Uncontrolling Love of God. And the, the center chapter lays out seven different models of God and my own being in the middle of those seven. <laughs> um, but you asking me about open theism. I like to talk about open and relational theology and philosophy as a kind of an umbrella under which there's process theology, openness theology, relational theology. But all, all of those are suspicious of what you call the omni attributes, or at least suspicious of the usual way people have thought about omnipotence and omniscience in particular. Right. In terms of omniscience, uh, people in this open and relational umbrella, they think God knows everything that's knowable. But they think God experiences, they, we, I think God experiences time moment by moment so that the future is open. And because it's open, hasn't been decided, isn't settled, isn't fixed, there's nothing that we can know about the future. It just hasn't yet happened. And so God doesn't know the future because there is no future yet to know until it becomes the present. So we think God knows everything. God is omniscient. But the, 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 um, the data, you might say, in God's knowledge is different from the way people who think of God knowing everything and sitting outside of time and seeing all past, present, and future all in one look. Um, so in terms of, oh, in terms of omnipotence, um, open and relational thinkers have different kinds of views. I'll talk about my own in particular. I think the word omnipotence, at least as usually used, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. No professional theologian or philosopher I know thinks God is omnipotent in the kind of ways most people think God is omnipotent in the church pews. <laughs> right. Like no one, well, I could think of one person in history who thought God could do what is illogical, and that's Rene Descartes, but not Calvin, not Augustine, yada, yada, yada. Um, I also don't think God can contradict God's own nature. God can't make a rock so big God can't lift it. I mean, there's all kinds of things I think God can't do. My particular thing, and I'm sure we'll get into this, is going to be uh, talking about God not being able to prevent evil. But the general response to you is that those words omnipotent and omniscience, we in open and relational theology, we can use them. But what we mean by them is pretty different from a lot of what other people mean. So what are some of the main considerations that sort of drove you to this view then? Is it, I mean, obviously the problem of evil, as you've just mentioned, and as the book is is basically about, um, that that's going to be a big one. Is there anything aside from that that came into this that personally Many kind of push, pushed you in that direction? Many things, yeah. The problem of inerrancy, or maybe we'll broaden it right. a little bit and call it the problem of divine revelation. If there's a God... If this God loves us and wants to communicate something to us, and if our own good is somehow tied to understanding what this God reveals and communicates, wouldn't this God make it crystal clear, unambiguous, so that such that we have no doubts? And yet I've got tons of doubts. And my views about God are different than other people's views. And the Bible itself doesn't have an inerrant, consistent witness and so um, that's one consideration. Another consideration has to do with um, if this God is so loving and wants us to thrive, why wouldn't this God just with a snap of a finger stop things like climate change? Right. Now, this is related to the problem of evil, but it's a little bit different in the sense of being proactive in the natural world. Um, maybe I'll just mention one, a third one. Um, most of us, think that our choices have have significance, really matter. But if God has the kind of omnipotence most people have thought, that God either controls over all things or make, only allows things and could control it, then our choices aren't really significant. They don't ultimately matter. And so I could name some others, but these are some of the things that, in my mind, you know, I've been thinking about these since I was probably in, you know, 14 or 15, these are questions that I had that could only be answered well with a different understanding of God's power. 
So if we begin to talk about the problem of evil then, and I yeah. suppose, it, I mean, th that's a big topic in and of itself. Could yeah. you briefly sort of go over what the what the problem is from a philosophical point of view? And then I think I think you'd also maybe, as you do in the book, want to bring it more down to earth with like these real cases. Because I think yeah. in philosophy, we can often sort of sit in our armchairs and think about, you know, like, well, find find the contradiction in terms of something like that. Whereas in yeah. your book, you obviously you, you bring out all of all of these cases. And I think when when you talk about God's nature being a certain way and then you talk, you paint a picture of something that's really happened in someone's life, it can be very difficult to go, you know, to, to just sort of sit back and go, oh, well, you know, there's this metaphysical category that I've got in my mind or whatever, you know, when, it, when there's a real person who's suffering in that way. Right, yeah. right, yeah. So generally the way uh, philosophers and scholars talk about the problem of evil is they say it has three basic premises or three basic statements. Um, if there's a God, this God is omnipotent or all powerful or almighty. There's different words we use about God's power. And if there's a God, this God is going to be perfectly loving, benevolent, good, you know, all the time. And yet there's evil in the world that one would think a perfectly loving God wouldn't want and could have the power to stop. Therefore, Either God's not omnipotent or God's not perfectly loving or what we think is evil is not really evil or there's just no God. So those are kind of your four big options. Right. Um, what real life examples do is help us to not punt to easy answers. <laughs> right. you know, what happens most of the time is people begin to think about this question and maybe they'll say, well, you know, I know that I've gone through some tough times in the past, but I'm a better person for it. Or, you know, there's something good that happened to me now that I wouldn't have happened had I not gone through the past. Maybe, you know, maybe you had you had this girlfriend and, uh, you know, she broke up with you and it broke your heart. But the girl you're married to now is so amazing and you would have never married her. Yet. So you think, well, look, it all ended up being great after all. Um, the problem with that approach, of course, is that there's all kinds of things that don't end up better. Yeah, uh, People die. <laughs> Dead people don't learn. <laughs> uh, so they don't have their characters built. Or mm. someone else will come along and they'll say, you know, the reason you're going through the problems is that God is punishing you. It's, it's your fault. Or maybe you're just part of a human race and God's pissed at everybody. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense if you think God is perfectly loving. Right. Other people will say, well, it's just free will. And the free will argument has a lot of merit to it, but there's a couple of problems with the way it's stated in its typical you know, ways. One is that there are some evils that occur that don't seem to be caused by anybody's free will. Take the current pandemic as a great example. It doesn't seem like anybody misused their free will to cause all the havoc that's going on right now. Um, secondly, um, most people who think that God gives free will also think that God has the kind of power to take that free will away if God wanted to or decide not to give it in a particular circumstances. And wouldn't that be convenient if just before some guy is going to rape some girl, God took away that guy's free will and couldn't rape her? I mean, every I would think that'd right. be a nice thing and she would, too. Uh, so the usual, the traditional free will defense doesn't give good answers to difficult questions like that. Yeah. So is it is it sort of um because I, I suppose in in uh, apologetics books or philosophy of religion books they'll talk about kind of this idea of a defense or a theodicy, and I think it can kind of it it can sometimes feel, especially in the case of the defenses, like it's almost a, a just so story and it really doesn't it doesn't hit that emotion the emotional hit of the suffering because it's like you know oh well for all we know you know satan and his demons caused that hurricane that caused mil killed millions of people and it's like well I, i'm not going to go with her for all we know where, when i look at those people in their actual suffering you know like if, if there's a god that's like that i want so or the morally sufficient reasons uh response i think a lot of people i, I mean you were you were particularly harsh i, I think against the um, God permitting evil kind of talk as well you know he right. he permits it and and you talk about um you know would we in is there any other case where if someone had the power to kind of intervene 
um, and they were just kind of sitting by and they they sort of permitted it to happen where we'd go, oh yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, the exemplification of the good right there. Um, yeah. is, is there anything I, you want to say about that stuff before? Uh, yeah, there's lots of things I'd like to say. Yeah, I really like the way you set that up. I'm so dissatisfied with what people call a defense of God in the face of evil. And that's a really common move among Christian thinkers. What it really says is they're not willing to rethink deeply questions about God power. And they're, as the word suggests, they're just playing defense here. They're saying, well, you can't say we're an idiot that we still believe in God despite evil, because it just may be the case that God has reasons not to intervene to prevent this particular evil. My approach is to play offense. I think we ought to present the most plausible picture of God to make sense of all dimensions of reality and not just sort of say, well, you, can't, you haven't proven us wrong. We ought to say, here's the best picture. This model of God makes the best sense overall. Right. Now, there's some people who are even further than the fence. They, they're called skeptical theists. And they think, well, you can believe in God, but you don't even have to try to give a defense. It's just sort of out of your capacity to know anything about God. And to those people, I always, I always kind of, uh, what's the right word? I, I think it's odd that they seem to know lots of things about atonement theories right. <laughs> and all other kinds of things. That but seem no one further, is difficult. Yeah. 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 <laughs> seem further down the list of most atheist questions. <laughs> but on that big one, oh, you know, it's a mystery. Right. That just doesn't hack it for me yeah yeah so um if we talk about your solution then so you in terms of you talk you talked about various ways that people can reject it amongst them one of them being that god doesn't exist which is an option that lots of people kind of take but i guess you you go about thinking well well which of the these properties that god apparently has and i suppose that i mean that language is kind of you know like god has properties is probably not the right way of talking about it but you know how can we how can we reconceptualize these or, or rethink of these in a way that then can make sense with experience and how is it that you go about doing that yeah well first of all i think there are at least a half a dozen good arguments not proofs but arguments for why there would be a god you know and you've you know them all, I'm sure, things like the moral sense we have, various religious experiences not only I've had, but other people have had around the world in different cultures, etc. questions of beauty and design, those kinds of things. None of those, I think, prove God exists, but they're part of a case one might make. But none of those really make a lot of sense if we continue to think God has the kind of controlling power God, many people think God has. So take the argument from design. There's a lot of beauty in the world, but there's a lot of ugliness too, right? <laughs> a lot of things suck. I, I'm, I'm a big time outdoors person and the outdoors have massive beauty, but there's ugliness, pain in the outdoors as well. And you would wonder why a God who was apparently able to do anything would have so much pain and evil and ugliness in the world. So I think we ought to rethink God's power. I think we ought to get rid of the usual ways of thinking God being able to do anything and say something like this. God is powerful. God's influential. But God simply can't single-handedly bring about any outcome in existence. God always acts. God always calls. But creatures have to be responding to God appropriately. Or the conditions of creation, you know, I don't think rocks can respond to God. The conditions of creation have to be conducive for the good that God wants to have happen. So God never single-handedly does anything or brings about any outcome. And that's a different way of thinking about God's power than most people have thought about it. So, so I suppose um, a, a lot of those arguments that, get, that are going to get you um to god's existence in the first place they're going to give god a particularly um a particular role in well well it's not even right to say a role in reality because it's almost the foundation of reality itself in, in in the majority of those cases where you know god's creating the entire kind of causal series of the natural world for example or instant uh, and i think then people find it very difficult you know in, in virtue of what are we saying that god can't you know what what are these things that that are preventing god from being able to do 
certain things that you know if he can create everything can't can't god just you know do what he want or reach out what like why why not what's what's stopping him sort of thing yeah all right here's where i'm gonna blow a few people's minds nathan okay i don't think god created out of absolutely nothing i don't think there was ever a time in which god existed all alone and for whatever reason said hey i think i'm going to create a universe but i'm not going to use anything that i've already created in the past because there is nothing that I've already created. There's absolutely nothing but me. And out of nothing, I'm going to go poof. And 13.8 billion years ago from our time, God created the universe. I think God everlastingly creates. God has always been creating. And God creates out of that which God previously created. And that creative process has no absolute beginning. Now, that might sound like a weird idea to a lot of your listeners, viewers, um, but it doesn't contradict sacred scriptures. The Bible doesn't say anything about God creating out of absolutely nothing. And what it does is it says that God, because God's always creating in relation to something else, God never has carte blanche. God's always loving and creating in relation which means that God can't theoretically set up all the laws of existence. There are going to be metaphysical laws that obtain no matter what cre uh, creaturely order or creation that is there. And that's going to help us then overcome your excellent question about, well, you know, why wouldn't God just do a better job of setting things up in the first place? Well, God did do a good job, but God couldn't do absolutely anything God wanted because there are certain metaphysical laws and structures that are necessary wherever there's creaturely others. And God responds and reacts to those as well. So, so on your view, then, um, is there a sort of meta divine reality? You know, like is God within at, within a reality? Um, you know, outside of which there might be necessary truths like um, the good or something like that, or the way that the charge of an electron can be, I, I, you know, maybe that's not an essay, but, you know, two plus yeah, two yeah. equals four or whatever. Yeah. It's pretty common for even Christian philosophers who don't like, who, who I'll say it this way, who accept creation out of nothing to say that there are certain metaphysical principles or platonic forms that even God didn't create. I would say they're in God's nature. But yeah, right. there's yeah. more than just an isolated God and, you know, all the, the numbers God just brought into existence. Uh, I would say they're in God's nature. But I think more pertinent to your question in terms of creation, um, let me say this. Most theists, especially professional theists, think that the ultimate reality is only God. And then God decided to create something. I think ultimate reality includes both God and some kind of creaturely others. Right. Um, and that's a different way of looking. I think it has biblical support. I'm not saying my idea is, you know, right there in Genesis 7 or something, but I'm saying it fits the, the biblical portrayal of God better than the idea that God created something out of absolutely nothing. And, and, in your view, then, are those creaturely others dependent on God for their existence, or right. do they have they have an independent existence that just is in relation to God? Well, they're dependent upon God to exist, but because, in my view, God's love is always self-giving and others empowering and therefore uncontrolling, they have a kind of independence that even God can't control once God creates them. And now, since God's, in my view, nature is to create, God must create. So you've got this interesting thing going on. Yes, we're all dependent upon God moment by moment to act first, to give us our gift of life and freedom if we're complex. But because God must do that because of God's love, not even God can control us. So, so if we begin... Um painting uh, some of this sort of metaphysics back into um, our experience of reality and suffering and evil and e evil in the world. So let's say, um, I don't know, some, something that's happened that we probably all agree upon that's bad, like 9-11 and the ensuing kind of like invasion, the wars and stuff like that. So at, at the point in time where that happens, the future is open. So God doesn't have foreknowledge. Does God have like... Um, 
but d does God have like pretty good predictions though about what's going to happen? You know, kind of like because because he, he knows certain things about the physical states of affairs and he can look at them. Right. Yeah. God would know all the possibilities and God would know probabilities based upon things that are happening in the immediate past. So we might say God's probabilities for distance events is pretty low, but things that are just about ready to happen, they're pretty high. Um, so, yeah, God would know, for instance, just before those planes hit the Twin Towers, that God doesn't know with certainty it's going to happen. But right. God's got, you know, pretty good idea it's going to happen, just like you and I would <laughs> yeah, seeing yeah. those planes go in. But because God can't control anyone or anything, including planes, God can't single handedly prevent that. God might be calling upon, you know, people in the plane or some of the hijackers to do something different so that they don't run into the building, and kill all those people. I think God was doing that. But they can ignore God, just like you and I have, you know, ignored what the right thing to do and done something else. So, yeah, that's how I think about it. So th I think something interesting in that is, um, you know, if God doesn't sort of have the causal powers to prevent the plane from doing something but he can call to you know like work through people and stuff what what does that kind of talk about god working through um people mean if if, if that there are some ways that god can interact but other ways he kind of can't uh, what are they how, how is that happening yeah yeah so i have a fairly standard view of god's we might say composition or ontology that is i think god is a spirit uh, God is, to use the language of Jews, Muslims, and Christians from ancient times, God's incorporeal. God doesn't have a physical body like you and I do. So while you and I can sometimes use our physical bodies to stop evil, maybe in the case of the plane, somebody had they had the opportunity to grab the, the what do you call it, steering wheel? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, joystick or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and could veer it off, you know, they could have used their body. Maybe I wasn't there, but let's just say theoretically that was possible. Yeah. God doesn't have that kind of divine hand to do that, but God can call upon us to use our hands. So, you know, you probably heard the classic line that we can be the hands and feet of God. So that's a way of saying that we can respond to this spirit that calls upon us. I, I suppose the, the question is, sort of like what does that mean like god god kind of interacts with people through their conscience or through oh, oh, um right. yeah like you know like are, are there souls that people have and god can i don't know somehow get a message into someone's mind or, or um i don't think you're i'm yeah. not a big fan of souls i mean if you define it in a particular right. way i could probably buy it but i do think we have minds and i embrace another view that's going to probably strike some of your viewers and listeners as kind of wild I think this panpsychist view, which is right. that all of reality is, has some kind of experiential dimension and even a measure of mentality. Um, I don't think rocks have mentality, but the tiniest entities that make up the rocks might have mentality. But I do think amoeba have something like responsiveness. I think cells do. And of course, complex creatures like rats and dogs and chimps and bonobos and you and me, we've got lots of mentality. In fact, you and I have consciousness. And so um, the idea is that God has the capacity to communicate to us, uh, not through our five senses, but directly as a causal agent to our minds and all the other aspects of our body. But here we're talking particularly about minds in such a way to, to use common language, call or persuade or woo or incline us toward the best possible given the situation so right you know, god doesn't call us to do something that we can't do it's uh given what's possible and, th and that would sort of be you know uh, the the moral sphere on this view so when you know as, as we go about doing stuff maybe we have a sense that this is the wrong thing to is to do or we feel guilty about something afterwards and you say that this is sort of god interacting in that way and i mean inclining i wouldn't well. say all of our guilt is from god sometimes we have false yeah. guilt right but i think it's more than just morals nathan i think uh, our sense of beauty i'm a photographer and I sometimes sense that there's some inclination to pursue something beautiful there. And maybe it's the muse, but maybe it's God. I actually think I believe in both. But um, there's something going on there. Or 
you know, sometimes in our quest to, for truth, we have just this longing for what's right. I think God is part of that. So it's not just morals. We can extend it to other dimensions as well. So then to, to touch on like a key point then in Christian theology, uh, to move on to Jesus and the incarnation, um, what is that then? What, you know, uh, God takes on, uh, I, don't, I don't know even know what language to use, uh, avatar isn't right, God, God incarnates. <laughs> um, and and so, I mean, on, I, I suppose on, on your view, God's suffering anyway when you know when we uh when we suffer and he he experiences that but the, but the incarnation is like a demonstration of that um what how how does that come about how does you know how how does um how does mary end up being pregnant with christ in the first place uh, that's a difficult question i suppose yeah, for almost right. any christian worldview and then what what is uh you know what what is christ um yeah. in Great in terms question. of this theology I'm a fan of what some Christian theologians call deep incarnation. And that's the idea that God's always incarnate, not just in Jesus, not just in the saints. God's always incarnate in this little cup that I've been drinking. God is present. Now, this cup isn't God. I'm not God. The world isn't God. But God is present, too, and influencing and interactive at all levels of existence. So then what we have in Jesus is someone who's unique and special in the way that he responded to God's call in his life. And in fact, that response made possible new ways for God to uh, um, call Jesus that are unique to him. Not that, you know, he had supercharged powers or something, but because he repeatedly said yes to God's love in his life, there were new possibilities that God offered to him that God had, couldn't have offered to others who weren't saying yes to God. And therefore, Christians like me can say, that Jesus, he's the supreme revelation of God's nature. That's our best example of love. And that's why I'm personally a follower of Jesus. I, I want to love like he did. Right. Um, this is a different kind of Christology than what some Christians have embraced throughout the ages. Scholars usually call this a spirit Christology because it's Jesus responding to the spirit. I think it fits really nicely with the New Testament. It doesn't fit so nicely with some of the later creeds. And some of those folks who are right. uh, opposing those creeds have certain metaphysical commitments that I think we ought to reject. But I think it fits pretty well with Scripture. So in, in terms of some of those points that people might um, know or or um, think of as kind of like um, – core to Christianity, like Christ having two natures, for example, or the Logos um, being bit begotten, not made, and stuff like that. Um, are, are those things that you would adhere to on this uh, theology, or are those some of those things that you're saying are more later kind of creedal things that you might um, disagree with? Yeah, I'm not a real fan of the two natures thing. I don't think there's good support for that. Um, I could use that language, kind of meld it around using some of my metaphysical commitments. Right. But I think the language itself is so fraught with problems and metaphysical baggage that I just shy away from it. Or Jesus as begotten. You know, I could say that too. But what I would mean by that would be different from what a lot of people in uh, the Christian tradition have said. Right. So I rarely say that sort of thing. But I can say things that those in the tradition have to kind of you know, cross their fingers over when they say, like, Jesus truly did suffer. He truly right. was tempted. It wasn't just sort of a little game, you know, well, he's God. Who, right. who can tempt God? Jesus really was tempted. Um, and I think a lot of Christian theologians in the centuries, they'll say that, but they're really crossing their fingers because yeah. it's hard to really imagine that he was. Um, and, and then what, what I suppose on that point then, actually to talk about this idea of um impassibility and god, god feeling things and stuff like that um so i suppose i suppose for for a lot of orthodox um believers again god to to say that god suffers in a particular way is sort of to lower god or something to make god kind of more like a creature than this ground of being whereas that's something that you're you're rejecting here that could, could you paint this picture of how it is that God, God suffers and also why that doesn't, on your view, make God like worse or less powerful or something like that, yeah. as, you know, as the critic might 
Fantastic. Yeah, on this view, boy, I have so much scripture on my side. <laughs> a God being passable or relational, God being affected by what we do, God being influenced. I mean, the vast majority of the Bible supports that view. Now, folks who think that God isn't passable or is impassable, they'll say, well, that's all just projections of human things upon God. But people in my camp can say, no, 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 no. Um, if we start with God is love, it makes a whole lot of sense to think that God is also relational. I mean, what kind of love is not relational in our understanding of it? And so we take seriously not only the Christian scriptures, but the uh, Islam and other traditions as well that said God is really interactive. Now, the problem that sometimes arises when you say God is passable and relational or even emotional is that then you start to worry that this God might let God's emotions turn God bad or, you know, get the best of them or, you know, right. had a bad day and God's going to, you know, make somebody pay kind of a thing. Right. And the way that uh, folks in the open relational uh, uh, tradition solve this or handle this problem is to say that God's experience is relational, is changing. But God has an essence or a nature that's unchanging. So right. we can count on God always to be loving and good because that's God's nature. But the way God expresses that love and goodness is changes moment by moment in real give and receive love relationships with others. It's sometimes called dipolar theism. I call it God's essence experience binate. There's these two dimensions. And the, 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 probably the easiest analogy I can give is this. Nathan, you are radically different than you were 15 years ago. I don't know. How old are you? I'm 24 now. 24. I have to think about it now, though. I, I've got less than my, <laughs> somewhere between 23 and 24. I've, I've got confused. All yeah. right. You probably have <laughs> pictures of you 22 years ago when you were one or two years old. Yeah. You are radically different. You've changed over that time. However, if we think there's something like a human nature that you and I both share, that stayed the same. That's an essence. Now, there's, it's debatable whether or not there's such a thing as human nature. But just for the sake of argument, let's say there is. So your nature or essence as a human, that remains constant. But how you express that nature has changed not only in 22 years. It's changed since the start of this particular discussion we've had today. So if we take that kind of analogy and apply it to God, but just say God's nature is everlasting. I don't think yours is, but God's is everlasting. Right. And you get an idea of what I'm talking about. So, so is um, this nature progressing towards something? You know, is there a kind of a kind of end? And then I suppose there's questions that that if the answer is yes, there's questions that that raise. You know, is that kind of greater than God? Is it kind yeah. of moving? You know, that it's moving God in that direction or something or and open um, yeah. relational thinkers, they would say, no, God's nature never changes. It's everlastingly steadfast and unchanging. However, God's experience does change. And God is calling, luring, persuading, working with creation in order for, to use language I like to use, for love to win, for there to be the kingdom of God on earth, to use Christian language, right. for well-being to be pervasive. And so there is the possibility, not the inevitability, but the possibility of this well-being being established on earth as it is in heaven. And if we do respond well to God, then God's own experience is enhanced. It's one of the things I write about in my brand new book that's coming out next month on open and relational theology. Our way of looking at God takes seriously the greatest commandment Jesus gives which is love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and that that love means we can actually enhance or improve god's experience that's not an idea augustine and other people could ever grasp when they had to do all kinds of gymnastics to get around it but we can say our lives affect god and our love for god pleases god i think that's pretty cool so, so is there, um, 
an eschaton in this view, you know, like a time where Jesus is going to return. And and obviously there's so many different Christian positions on that, you know, like yeah. pre-millennium, post-millennium, whatever. But is, is there some some kind of event where it's like, that's it, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's judgment day now. And then everyone's either going to like a heaven or hell. What What's the picture of this? How, how does open uh, theism play into painting that picture of what, of what all that talk in the Bible means? Yeah, there isn't a consensus view on that particular question. So there's a variety of visions of eschato eschatology. Is it okay if I tell you my own? Uh, yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. So people know I'm not, you know, giving the view of every open and relational yeah. thinker. <laughs> my view is this. God never gives up calling us and all creation to respond to God's love. While we're embodied in this particular world, and I happen to believe in an afterlife, in the afterlife as well, God doesn't send some people to eternal conscious torment in hell. I don't believe in hell in that sense. God also doesn't annihilate some people, like saying, you know, Nathan, I have given you 7,892 chances, so the next one is your last, and if you don't say yes, you're gone. Right. You're out of here. No, the God I believe in, to use the passage from uh, Corinthians 13, always hopes God's love never gives up and so God constantly calls invites now when we say no to God's love there are negative consequences not that God is pissed and is punishing us but the negative consequences are just the natural negative consequences that come from saying no to love and people can say no as long as they want God's never going to force anybody so there isn't some kind of guaranteed omega point in the future that God is right. going to make sure everybody gets to by hook or by crook. God's going to force it to happen. No, God will always persuasively invite. We have to respond. But because God never gives up, I have the genuine hope that all creation will one day, to use the language of the Apostle Paul, will one day be redeemed, not because God forced it, but because God's love was ultimately persuasive for everyone and everything capable of responding to God. And is, is there um, a particular atonement theology within that that goes alongside it? So obviously you talked about um, Jesus and what the incarnation means, but there isn't like this, this kind of penal substitution story, I suppose, right. that you know most Protestants are going to be very familiar with. Yeah. In open relational thought, there isn't like one obvious atonement theory that everybody goes for, but almost everybody rejects some of the major ones. <laughs> like nobody likes the penal one, the substitution yeah. one, you know, satisfaction theories. Yeah. Some people will work with the ransom theory, but that one kind of gives me creeps as well. Um, there is, you know, the the Abelard's uh, moral influence theory uh, has some good parts to it, but in my view, doesn't say enough. I actually have a couple of doctoral students who are doing work right now to kind of formulate what they think is going to be a, a better atonement theory, given what you know, scripture says about who God is. And given these intuitions about God that are evident in open relational thought. Uh, but I, I should I guess I should just say for now, there's a couple of things that I want in an atonement theory. First of all, I want a loving God who <laughs> doesn't have to kill somebody or, you know, <laughs> do deals with the devil. I want a loving God. <laughs> Two, I want an atonement theory that says my response or participation makes a difference. I mean, most atonement theories, if you start to think about them, we're just kind of passive pawns and God and does all the work either, you know, to appease God's self or to trick the devil or something. So we've got to play a role. And uh, three, I don't think there ought to be any limits. You know, I don't think there ought to be some people are go to heaven and some people go to hell. God's atonement ought to be available to everyone and everything. Now, how that shapes out, there's you know, there's more I can say, but uh, those are kind of the big ideas. So, so I guess I've got one more question, then we can go to some uh, people have been putting questions in the chat as we go along, if that's oh, all right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so the, the last one is sort of to do with religious pluralism then, 
and obviously that that would this would come under your idea that um you know no one's being left behind um by by god no one's going to hell for sort of having the wrong beliefs but how how does this play in, into this idea that there's you know these different religions with um competing claims is it would it be like a perennialist view would it just be like a pluralistic view um how, what are other religions and and how do they compare with say christianity which you you would say you know christianity's the one in a sense but um it's not exclusion it's not a exclusive sort of thing that's right yeah i wouldn't be an exclusivist uh, let me start by answering that question by saying an open and relational thinker because they think god wants to communicate but can't control others an open and relational thinker expects there to be religious pluralism because God's not guaranteeing some people get the right message and shunning other people. God's trying to reveal every good possible thing to everyone at all times. And it could be that some people are more conscious, more aware, more receptive, etc. So um, let me start there. Religious pluralism makes sense if God is open and relational. Second question or second dimension here might be, uh, does that mean then that all religious religions are equally valid? I don't think we need to say that. I don't think some versions of Christianity are equally valid. So right. why would I want to say every religion is equally valid? That doesn't make any sense. But there might be some insights that, let's say, Buddhists have that Christians could really learn from. Right. Um, so um, there's validity across the board, but we all might find some particular traditions or ideas more plausible than others and therefore want to situate ourselves more with that community than with others. Um, you know, I'm not particularly attracted to Hinduism. I like a lot of things in Buddhism, but at least most of the classic forms of Buddhism don't have a God, and I think there's reason to believe in God. So I can even sometimes pick and choose things from other religious traditions uh, that my tradition either doesn't have or doesn't emphasize, but ultimately at the end of the day, I'm really impressed with this Jesus guy. I really think, I mean, the most important thing for me, Nathan, is I want to live a life of love. And this Christian tradition and a particular understanding of the God in Christianity and Judaism, but especially Christianity, paints a picture of a perfectly loving God expressed in this guy, Jesus. And so I'm really attracted to Christianity. And that's the tradition I associate myself with. Awesome. So if we if we just go on to some questions then that people have been putting awesome. as we've been talking. Shall I look at them while you're doing that, or um, I can I can pop them up on the screen like okay. so, and cool. we can you should be able to see awesome. them. Yeah, excellent. Um, so Camille has asked, and thank you for the super chat by the way, Camille. A hundred um check thingies looks like it, it's a lot, so I appreciate that. Um, how does Daniel eleven work on open theism? If Daniel knew dozens of specific actions of Ptolemids and Seleucids in chronological order hundreds of years in advance, how did they have free will? How about, let me start by saying, I don't know, Camille. <laughs> 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 I don't remember that story well enough and I haven't thought it through. So let me just start with something really blunt and honest. I don't know. <laughs> now let me say a few other things. Um, when these stories are written, they're written after the fact. So that might be one way to try to tackle this, to say, you know, this is someone writing in hindsight. Um, that might be one approach. I don't know if that fits here or not. So I'm kind of winging some of the possible answers. Um, the other thing is, is it could be um, that there are certain things that people do freely that we know hundreds of years in advance they're going to do. Let me give it. Uh, an example of this. I am almost certain, I'm a philosopher, so I have a hard time saying certain. I am really, really confident that a hundred years from now, people are going to be having sex and they're going to be doing it freely. Now, I can't know that with certainty, but I can make some pretty good predictions knowing what I know about human beings. <laughs> and maybe this applies to this example or not. So again, I'm kind of winging it. I don't know exactly. So Maybe I should stop there, Nathan, instead of continuing to wing it uh, and just say, Camille, I'm not exactly sure on that one. Well, I, I, I think maybe something that this question is getting at is the idea of inerrancy as well. So sort of, oh. you know, like when, when there's um, prophecy and stuff in the in well, the Old Testament and the New Testament, I suppose, um, 
would you, would you be committed to the idea that that is always inerrant or infallible in some sense? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not in, uh, committed to inerrancy or infallibility, infallibility, but let me do talk about prophecy because that's a really important question for an open theist. As Camille probably knows, the vast majority of prophetic utterances in the Old Testament and New Testament, but here's especially the Old Testament, are not predictive prophecies. They're not saying, you know, this is going to happen in the future. They're prophecies that say, look, you people are acting wrong. You're sinning. You're worshiping idols, whatever it is. Uh, and if you don't change, bad things are going to happen. Well, you don't have to know the future to know that evil sucks. Sin sucks. And so that's uh, that's the first answer I give. The second is there do seem to be some claims in the Old Testament in which God says God will do something in the future. And God doesn't have to know the future exhaustively to have plans to do something in the future. So we can we can uh, address some of those prophetic utterances by just saying this is God saying God plans to do something. The third category I'll call prophetic utterances that are predictive in the future in which something very specific is said to have happened. And it isn't God doing it, but it's creatures doing it. Uh, my favorite example of this is Mike. When Jesus says to Peter, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Right. Now, some open theists have explanations for that, but I'm not really that convinced by their explanations. And so I just say, you know, that's one instance I can't handle. Now, I think the majority of the Bible fits an open and relational perspective, but I admit there's some passages that don't fit so well. Maybe this Daniel 11 is one of them. I don't know. Um, I'm comfortable thinking that the Bible isn't perfectly consistent throughout, because I don't think it's inerrant and infallible, but I do turn to the Bible for what I think are the primary, the dominant, the main themes of Scripture, which I think are the themes of love, freedom, the kinds of things we've been talking about today. So the Bible still is important to me, even though I don't think it's inerrant. So the next question, also from Camille, another super chat. So thank you. Was uh, open theists often criticize others for appealing to anthropomorphism in the Bible? Given this, does God have a nose? Uh, does he count grains of sand? Yeah, I love it. I don't know that open theists criticize others. That's interesting. Usually open theists are criticized for being so anthropomorphic, but it could go either way, I suppose. Uh, it's a great question. Um, and who asked this one? Is this Camille again? Uh, it's Camille again. And there's another Camille okay. one after this. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Camille, I think um, I think it's very difficult to take every biblical claim about God at face value as being literally true, like having a nose or you know, being a hen or being a rock. Uh, there's going to be some anthropomorphic there or anthropomorphic projections. However, what open theists want to do is avoid what we'll call, well, you mentioned the apophatic folks uh, earlier, Nathan. Um, I'll, yeah. I also might say classic theists or conventional theists. And they will typically say all these kinds of claims about God being relational or even loving or responding or repenting that are in the scriptures. They'll say, well, those are all anthropomorphic projections. And when you do that, then you end up presenting the ground of being or this static other, the stony kind of statue of a God that's not loving and relational in the way we think of. And so maybe it would be fair to say that open theists try to make sense of the God described in the Bible. And they really do privilege some passages or some ideas. And most of those have to do with relationship with love and love. And there are other passages that they also say must be anthropomorphic. God is a rock. God's not literally a rock. It's probably saying God's nature is steadfast and we can trust it. So open theists do some of those same interpretive moves, but they tend to end up being criticized for having a God who sounds a little too anthropomorphic, at least for some people. Can, can you still hear me, by the way? All right. I'm, I'm hearing. Yeah. You. Oh, okay. My um, browser froze for a second. I think I have too many tabs open. And yeah, I'm, ba I'm back now. So don't worry. I just wondered if I if I'd uh, dropped out or frozen for you there. Um, so another question that we got from Eric was Nathan, please ask your guest why God is hiding. Oh, I love that question. I love it because open and relational theists have a great answer. Before I give it, 
let me just say to, to uh, Eric, um, that is the answer, especially certain Calvinists give, that this God is hiding from us. Because in their view, God has the kind of power to be perfectly revealed, perfectly obvious. But remember, an open and relational God doesn't have the kind of power to give a crystal clear message and is a spirit who can't be perceived by our five senses. So you can't look out your back window and see God walking the dog or see God taking a nap under the Eiffel Tower. And God doesn't have a right a hand to write letters in the sky. I exist. So God is essentially incapable of giving an absolutely clear, clear and crystal clear message because that would require control. And because God is incorporeal, a, an omnipresent spirit, God can't, quote, reveal in a way that we could sense with our five senses. Now, I do think we have non-sensory perception of this spirit. Nathan and I talked about that earlier. But the God of open relational theology doesn't hide in the sense of voluntarily deciding to not be revealed. Um, I'm just looking for the next question. I've messed up the chat. So um, okay. <laughs> uh, he said, oh, I lost one of Camille's questions and he said, uh, you already answered it in the combo. Thanks. Okay. Um, Will we be able to perceive God in the afterlife? Beautiful question, Joshua. I think we can perceive God now, but not through our five senses. Let's get a little philosophical just for a second here. Um, our perception of reality is more than sensory. Right now, my mind is taking in input from my five senses, and it doesn't have eyes, ears, etc., and it's using various neural pathways and things. If we take that kind of an idea and expand it to the idea of non-sensory perception, some people we use language like intuition or sixth sense or still small voice, those are kinds of words you might have heard of. Um, then we can understand how our perception of God is actually happening, happening directly right now, but not through our five senses. Um, if you are interested in this topic, there's a number of things I've written on it, um, especially, though, uh, the ancient Brit uh, John Wesley dealt with this. And he speculated what he called spiritual senses. I think there's a way to talk about this and call them natural senses, but having a real interaction with God as spirit. Um, and then uh, Pine Creek Doug has asked if I can channel my inner Pine Creek and ask you <laughs> a speed round questions uh, about what you believe, starting with Genesis, uh, Old Testament atrocities, things Jesus said and did, heaven, how Whew. angels say. So so what 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 he means by this is like basically like a lean true or false to some pretty, oh, okay. I, I mean, qu questions that ordinarily, I suppose, would take a lot of unpacking and stuff like that, but just yeah. like a, a, a lean, true or false sort of thing on them. So like um, that, you know, like a, a, a global flood happened, for example. I doubt it. Um, that there was a first man and woman called Adam and Eve that God created. I doubt it. Um, doubt it. That Jesus commanded the killing of the Canaanites. I definitely think that's wrong. Jesus didn't do that. Or if you're talking about God and the Canaanites, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, in terms um, of a Trinitarian theology, that's why I always oh, phrase Oh, I that see. Way. That's yeah. it. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, just, can I expand on that just a second? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think the general drift of Scripture points to a God who's perfectly loving and that's best expressed in Jesus. But there are some portions of Scripture that don't portray God's loving. And I don't try to squint and kind of look at those and say, well, somehow killing babies is loving in God's eyes. I just say, no, they get it wrong sometimes in the Bible. Dead wrong. And I say that not because I think I'm more enlightened or I'm a 21st century postmodern hermeneutical whatever. I say that because the witness of Scripture as a whole points to a different kind of God than the one who wants babies killed. There's actually one of the more difficult of Pine Creek's questions. Um, I think this is the most okay. difficult one, so it might be interesting. Okay, um, good. Is, oh, what's it? What's it? So if you were in, 
so you God, God gives you basically gives you um, a privileged position where he's he's saying what do you what do you think I should do or what what would it be best to do I'm going to go with whatever decision you choose um, and the okay. and the options <laughs> are that so people people have become rebellious I can poof them out of existence or I can cause a flood that's going to drown them all um, which one would you go with <laughs> oh my well my God can't poof anybody out of existence. And my right. God doesn't have, can't create a flood single-handedly. Now, my God could, uh, in certain scenarios, call upon people to create a flood. Let's say there's a big dam and God wants, you know, God, theoretically, I don't think this happens, but theoretically, God could call Nathan to go poke a hole in the dam and cause a big flood. But that's not quite a worldwide flood. So, um, yeah, the hypotheticals that he's giving are interesting, but they don't apply to the God I believe in. And I think I think one of the last um, the last hypothetical would be um, if you asked Jesus about um, whether evolution is true, what would he say? Jesus wouldn't know. That's the same answer William Lane Craig gave actually to that question. Oh, really? Interestingly, huh? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus yeah. didn't know about evolution. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you and William Lane Craig have something, something in common. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few things I think. <laughs> no, I like Bill. We just think about God and reality differently. Um, another question then is, uh, how are you sorting truth statements uh, where proof does not exist, or maybe never did? Uh, I ask, as my view has been, if God exists, it is unobservable and unprovable either way. Okay, I'm sensing two questions there. Yeah, I think uh, so as well, which is... Yeah. So I don't think about true statements in the sense of proofs or not, as if you could be absolutely certain about them. I think of trying to make sense of reality based on plausibility, bringing in various sources, my experience and things, and then setting up certain models or accounts of things and trying to compare those to how they account for my lived experience, what science says, arts, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not so much about proofs for me as uh, most plausible hypotheses. I'm kind of a scientist at heart in that way. Um, and the second part I ask is my view has been, if God exists, it's unobservable and provable. I think God is unobservable. If you mean by actually seeing God, I think you can look at things that happen in the world and infer that God inspired them. So you might say a beautiful sunset is inspired by God or helping the poor is inspired by God. But that's not the same as seeing God. And unprovable, if you mean by that being certain, I'm not certain in my view. I don't think any person who believes in God should say they're certain, at least in the philosophical sense. Maybe, maybe they'll say they're certain and it's kind of just a personal testimony of conviction, but that's not quite the same. So I think that that kind of leads nicely into the last uh, audience question then, okay, which would, is, are you an evidentialist? Um, and if so, what are your reasons for embracing theism, Christianity, or thinking that any part of the Bible is inspired? Yeah, I'm an evidentialist, at least in, in one certain way of thinking. Um, I already said I'm a scientist, and so that probably tipped your hand there. So my reasons for embracing theism. Well, I've already kind of mentioned some of them. Um, some of my arguments and reasons sound pretty familiar to most people. Like I've already said that I want to have an account for my intuitions about love and my feeling that everybody ought to love and asking where that comes from. We've already mentioned uh, the kind of moral dimensions. I think I don't, you know, I think people have different understandings of what the morally correct thing to do is, but that there's a sign of moral sense is best pointed. Uh, we point to God as that, even though I believe in evolutionary uh, psychology and think evolution has a role to play as well. Um, you know, the beauty and the design in the world. I, I don't think God controlled things to set it up exactly the way they are, but I do think God is always in the business of trying to make something better. And that's oftentimes, but not always, oftentimes designing things and making it beautiful. Um, I'm not, well, this, there, let me see something controversial. Here, here. Let me distinguish myself from Bill Craig or William Lane Craig. I think the cosmological argument, as typically formulated, sucks. <laughs> I don't think it right. makes any sense. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
What about Christianity? Well, I've kind of mentioned that already. I think Christianity does a better job, at least some versions of Christianity. Some versions of Christianity, I, I think, are horrible, but some versions do a good job of portraying love and these kinds of things that I care about. And thinking any part of the Bible is inspired. Um, look, I think God is present in all creation. And I think the conversation Nathan and I have been having right now and you all been a part of, I don't have a problem saying this is inspired. I wouldn't put it on the same level as the Bible. I would probably put it above some of the things in the Bible. <laughs> I think our conversation is more inspired than saying that God wanted to bash babies' heads against the rocks. But there are other portions of Scripture that I think are pretty amazing. And, uh, and the reason I think they're amazing, well, they correspond with my deep intuitions about love, beauty, value, these kinds of things. So um, I'm not saying, well, I won't go any more into that. So I can say the Bible is inspired without saying all of it is equally inspired to the same degree or that all of it is inerrant. So we'll leave it there for questions then. But yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for participating in that as well. Um, in terms of directing people to more of your work, stuff that you're doing or stuff that you've got, got coming up, um, where can people go to find out more about um, what you're doing? Great. Well, I have a personal website that's my full name. You all can see it there. It's thomasjord.com. I also direct the Center for Open and Relational Theology. And it's got lots of great resources. You can see a bunch of other scholars, some more progressive, some more traditional, all under this open and relational umbrella that I have mentioned. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, Nathan, you've, you mentioned my book, God Can't, which is sold really well and helped a lot of people. But as I said earlier, I have this new book coming out in July called Open and Relational Theology, An Introduction to Life-Changing Ideas. And it's not written for people who act, have academic degrees in theology, although I think people who do have degrees will appreciate it. Uh, it's written for the average person, and it explains the, the deep ideas in very simple language. And I really encourage people to check it out. Yeah, well, I'll put links to some of those things in the description at some point, not straight. I, I never do it straight away, and people always complain because it takes me a day or two to get them in, but I, they, they will be there if you're watching this in uh, a day or so. You'll be okay. Um, I'll play us out with the closing credits then um, and, and the show, but thank you for coming on. It's been hey, great to talk. thank you. I really enjoyed it. Cool. And thank you everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed this, then be sure to share it with someone who you think would benefit from the conversation and leave a comment letting us know what you thought. Thanks everyone. Bye.